working well, and now we have an Indian dig going on here, and we've uncovered some of the old cellar holes that were here. They used to be where we're standing right now. There used to be a village here. It was a community. It was called The Hollow. And Abby Frizzell was a little girl here, and she, up to about age five, but she could still remember by looking at the cellar holes who lived where and what building was there. The fish hatchery was over here and the general store, <laughs> residences, and various mills. At one point there were three mills here and she was able to help us identify the cellar holes. So we have, we have the development of the village, I guess you could call it, uh, white folks, the Europeans uh, who moved in. And then if we dig a little bit deeper below that, we come up with Native American. And what we're finding here is Native American remains, stone tools, chips, spear points, arrowheads, mortise and pestles, all sorts of things. And that's what we're finding now. And that dig goes on every summer. And that's by the state of New Hampshire. The state archaeologist is here doing that. <clears throat> so we're looking back at the turn of the, of the last century when it was a village and now we're looking at if this is what they think it is early woodland period Indian culture is broken up into four various uh, periods or eras uh, we could be looking at what was here 3,500 years ago they were here probably for the fish can you imagine the salmon that must have come up in those early years this place would be teeming with them. You could probably walk across the river on them, thousands of them. And they fished and they fished. And we do find fish bones here. And we find turtle bones and we find other things. And this stuff is at least a meter deep in the ground. And maybe a little bit later we can go over and take a look at this. They're still at work here doing this thing. This, I picked this spot here is a good place to, to look at this photo. Um, this photo, is of the Holman uh, pulp mill, which was the, the first photo documented mill to be here in the hollow. And on the right hand side are some of the structures that we think were related to a, a tannery that was also here. And I think we're standing in about the right location for where this photograph was taken. I'll, I'll pass around. You can see the, the road coming up and, and sloping to the right. The first settlers to come into uh, to live what we know as Livermore Hollow now was Moses Little was his name and he purchased a property in 1769 I believe it was and he had he recognized the potential for power here with the the natural drop in the river and he he harnessed that he had a number of mills um, a sawmill a grist mill uh, there were a couple other types of mills that he had um, that were apparently pretty lucrative, but they were all washed away. There was a big flood in 1820, I think it was. They wiped out one of the bridges and that became a big lawsuit between Holderness and Campton, I believe, that who was gonna be responsible for replacing the bridge. So that, we found some of that uh, documentation from the courts and that kind of helped us figure out a little bit about the, the magnitude of that flood. And so we don't know where Moses Little's mills were, but they were, probably in the same area because that's where the, the water drops. So Holman Pulp Mill was the first um, big mill to come in. And if these trees weren't here, you would see the bridge. And we'll take a look at the bridge a, in a little bit. But this is an earlier rendition of, of the bridge. The bridge we, that's here now is known as the Pumpkin Seed Bridge. And it's a, this was a wooden truss bridge and it was replaced by a lentricular truss bridge. Floods and fires were really the, the big thing here. Um, but apparently the, all of the endeavors were making money because they kept rebuilding and every time they rebuilt, they rebuilt bigger. This is the location of, the, of Holman's Pulp Mill, which was the one in the photograph. I'm gonna pass this photo around as well because we still haven't done, uh, we haven't done any archeology span here for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason is that just like in all your professions, there's people who specialize in different types of things. We don't have anyone on staff that specializes, specializes in industrial, industrial archeology, span which is a whole other 
category. Um, and for this particular site, we need someone that knows how to interpret how the water was used to, to run the mill workings. Um, but I think that this area behind you is actually part of that, um, uh, the course where the water came through, which I believe would be right about in here in this photo. So in, remember in the LIDAR image, I showed you the natural channel. The, so that's right here, all this stone. That's, the river is actually on the other side. But when the mill was, was being used, they had a dam upriver that channeled the water through here. And it would have come down somehow through this drop in elevation. I believe that the mill workings would have been in this sort of wheel pit, I guess for lack of a better term, that would have run the mechanisms for, for making the wood pulp. And then it would have exited from what we can tell looking at the photos. It looks like the water exited out across these rocks through here. Mm. And again, that's really just based on, on the photographic interpretation. So this was Holman's. Um, you can see there were other buildings that uh, developed up around them. Um, the tannery was one of the businesses that seemed to be working at the same time. And then there's a number of houses that pop up. So this was the beginning of, of a little enclave um, that became known as, as Livermore Hollow. So there were, from what we've read in the uh, historical accounts, there were up to seven houses here. There's some reports that say there was a school, although we haven't found any, any other mention except for one, um, and that there was also a store in, in the hollow. As we, as we head out, you're gonna see uh, a long wall that we walked across. So as I mentioned that when the, when Holman's burned down and was rebuilt and then burned down again, uh, another company came in called the Fiberwood Company and look how much bigger they made their mill. We're standing in, in about the same spot. Um, so this is much, much bigger and you'll see the walls as we go out that incorporate uh, the Fiberwood Company and a company called the Eastern Lignoid Casket Company, which made a caskets out of a pressed type of wood which I always think a particle board, and I think that probably wouldn't be a very good casket, but mm -hmm. apparently these pressed wood caskets were really popular in the late 1800s. Um, so again, they had floods as well, and we'll see some of the evidence of that. But as we walk out, the walls that we're gonna be walking along, you'll see the brick are all from these, these companies that came later. These are, these are probably from, I think, the late 1890s. So. It's that lentricular truss bridge that came in after the wooden truss bridge. Um, connecting uh, the east to the west side of the river. So the, the, it was a, a, actually a road, it was not a railroad bridge. It's sometimes confused with the railroad bridge, but the road surface was on the top. So it's a little different than a lot of bridges of its time because the, the main structure was underneath. Um, the road was on top rather than a lot of like the covered bridges have the support up top. So that, uh, is a little bit of a, a problem right now. There's a, this is a really big popular spot for Plymouth State students and, and kids that live nearby to come in the summertime, you know, when it's really hot. And unfortunately, there's become this uh, phenomenon of, of jumping off the bridge and it's been really bad. Every year, there's a number of kids get either injured or killed. In fact, when we were here in 2017, we had just left and the following week, um, a young, young man jumped and, and was killed. Uh, but if you look behind the bridge, you will see what looks like the little turrets of a castle. That's the base of the windows of the, the Henry and Sons pulp mill. Here's a photo of it in, in the 1920s in really high water. So this was a, a big employer uh, for for people that lived here in the hollow. In fact, the, the woman we interviewed, I'm gonna show you her where she lived, her father worked over here in the Henry and Sons mill. Um, it was part of a big corporation that had a, a number of mills up in the, in the Lincoln area. Um, they, as a result of the, the mills, that mill in particular, to the, the water quality was really bad here at, in the 50s. Um, there was foam on the water and wood pulp would, would wash up on the beach and apparently it smelled really bad from what we've we've heard from some of the people that live in the area 
Um, a lot of the people that didn't live in the hollow wouldn't go into the hollow because they said that it smelled and, and was dirty. But Henry and Sons Mill um, closed abruptly in 19, 1950s. Uh, the workers showed up and there was a sign on the door that said, mill is closed, you're no longer needed. Um, so that kind of spelled, and one of you asked about, was you asked when it ended here in the hollow? That was kind of the end of it. Um, there was, at that time, there were still a few houses left. I think there were five. Um, shortly after that mill closed, one of the people who was still employed by the mill company um, tore down, I believe, five of them and said that he used the lumber to build his own house, which was a pretty common practice, you know, when, when resources were tight. Um, so we're still trying to find, we've only accounted for two houses, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but that was kind of the end of the hollow when they, when they closed down. There was uh, maybe one more family that lived here for, sh for a short time and was paying rent to the Henry and Sons. And then after that, it was pretty much the end. Um, remained cleared till it, up into the 90s. And then that's when, when Tink uh, Taylor was talking about having the legislation to, to turn it into a park. And that's kind of when there was renewed interest. Uh, behind me, the so-called Pumpkin Seed Bridge. It was built in the late 1800s, about 1887. It was built by Plymouth, Campton, and Holderness. The three towns contributed to it. And it was to give new access over the river. In those days, they had wooden bridges. One, they had several times that they'd been taken out by floodwaters. But this was going to be, this is steel, wrought iron. And this was built by the Berlin Bridge Company out of Connecticut and they built it for about $7,200, and you can see it, and it carried traffic until 1952. 1952, it was, I guess you would say, it was abandoned. It was blocked off so nobody could cross over it, and it was replaced by other bridges. So 1952 on, it was not used. And then, if I don't know if the camera picks it up or not, one span was cut loose and dropped. The bridge was sold for scrap, and the gentleman who was going to take it down for its scrap value never finished the job. They dropped the, they dropped the eastern span, got dropped. It's in the gorge up now. You can still see it. And the rest of the bridge was left behind. Uh, we think it's the only one of its type left in the northeast. What makes it unique is that you can see that the truss work, which was what gives it its name, pumpkin seed, the truss work looks like a pumpkin seed, what gives it its its uh, underpinnings is under the deck instead of over. Most of these bridges you'll see the truss work will be on top over the travel deck. In this bridge you have all the truss work underneath it. It makes it unique. We'd like to see it put on the National Register of Historic Places and my dream is to turn it into an observation deck. This is an exciting, probably to me, one of the most exciting parts of this whole project. So 2017, we wanted to look at the, uh, one of the two remaining cellar holes and try to learn about the people that, that lived here and worked here. And I'll show you the picture of the house. Okay, so in this photo, it's this house right here. Okay, so the, the cellar hole is actually um, in the middle of the house and the, the two-story section of the house ran along these little footings. You can kind of see them. They look almost like field stones, the form of square or rectangle. So it, when we came out here, I was really a little concerned because I thought this house is too big to have, you know, why would they have the two story portion of the house just on this? Mm -hmm. So I was really confused as to where I was on this photograph and it was really starting off to be a bad field season. But we went back to our office and we have a bunch of architectural historians there. And they said that that was really not uncommon, that the, the main portion of the house would be built on the footings. And the cellar hole was really just used for food storage. So it was underneath the kitchen. And it, it wasn't, it may have been an earlier part of a, it may have been part of an earlier house that was added onto. But the thing to keep in mind was the mill company owned these houses and was providing the houses for the workers. And they were 
considered somewhat temporary, so I don't think they put a lot of money into them. So we excavated here. Um, we, we did a number of the bigger excavation units. So those are the things that come in after the 1A test, I mean the 1B test. So we know we have a site and they're really to recover more information. So we did test pits all around here and we found material dating back to the 1860s. Uh, we found a really nice clay pipe stem, uh, not, not a stem, but the entire pipe smoking. We had a photograph of some of the, the mill workers and there's one guy with, with a pipe. So I automatically said, that's his pipe. We found his pipe. It was beautiful about this long with the maker's mark. Um, it came from um, Scotland said E. Davis on it, so that was kind of nice. Uh, we found a lot of personal artifacts, um, some jewelry, um, really what you'd expect to find at a site of this date, and, and, a, and a worker's house. I mean, there wasn't anything that was really high-end as far as the ceramics. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so if you look at the guy in the middle, he's got my pipe uh -huh. that we found. <laughs> um, but yeah, the date ranged from uh, about the 1860s all the way up till about the week before we got here because this, I remember, is kind of a party spot for people. You know, we found beer bottles and, and that sort of thing. But um, just trying to distinguish and determine the layers of occupation has been, been our challenge. Uh, but we were very fortunate because we got to have the assistance of a woman named Abby Brown Frizzell. And she lived here in this house in the 19, late 1940s. Um, Tink Taylor introduced us to her. And I thought, because we had the money for an oral historian, and I thought, what is a, someone who was four going to remember about living in their house? And I started to think about when I was four and what I remembered from my house. And it was, it was a lot more than I expected, but it was things that were kind of kind of basic, like um, the color, you know, of the floor, the things that when you're on that, this tie off the ground, the, cover, the color of the kitchen, that sort of thing. Um, but our first big thing to, was that we wanted to make sure that we were at the right house that was hers. So three, we did three interviews. Two of them were done before she even came down here and she did a floor plan from memory of what she remembered her house to be, and it matched up almost perfectly. So the last day she came down here, it was a Friday, it was a beautiful afternoon. She walked in through here and she said, oh my God, this was my house. She said, my bedroom was over on this side. I can remember hearing the river, and I remember my mother used to sit over here, and just all these memories started coming out. And we said, well, do you remember anything about the color of your house? And she said, yes, it was puke red, just like all the mill buildings, all the property that the mill company owned. And we found these clapboards that were this strange color of red. Um, and at Christmas, she sent me this photo. This has been colorized by, you know, some process, but this shows, I think that's her little sister. Um, but everything matched up perfectly. So this area here would have been the section under, uh, above this foundation and the two stories, it was over here. Um, that was pretty much the living room and bedrooms and then the kitchen. And they also did, she remembered there being a little barn off the back and that um, shows up in the, in the historic photos. So we had a bunch of questions for her um, that we thought might help us learn a little bit about the earlier people here because again she was 19 early 1940s um, the big question was where were they getting their water from because when you guys are out in the field and you start coming across cellar holes most of the time there's a well nearby and so be careful when you're walking around because sometimes they're kind of grown over but we haven't found any any um, wells anywhere around here and we've looked pretty extensively so we asked her that and she said well we used to go across with my father across the field to the spring and get the water there. And I was like, I know there was mention of a spring when the fish hatchery was here, but she said, we just went right out there. It was right across the field. So it's grown up quite a bit now, but um, 
So we think that was probably the water source for the mill workers because they weren't drinking out of the river because it was so bad. And she said that when she was here, the, they never went near the river. It was there, you know, she remembered hearing it, but her mother would, would have them play out here. They would go to the spring if they were gonna swim because it was just so dirty. Um, so some of the other questions we asked her just about the being here in general, they had, they paid $8 a month for, to live here. They had no electricity, they had no running water, and they had no telephones. So, I mean, those things were in existence, but they, and I'm not sure whether it was by choice or whether it was just they wanted someplace cheap to live. Um, so they were here uh, probably six or seven years, I believe. Um, and we found uh, artifacts that, that dated to, to World War II. We found a, a trench lighter, which was a, a lighter that apparently didn't, you couldn't see the flame. You could light the cigarette, but you wouldn't see the flame so that you were not picked off by snipers when you were in the trenches. We found uh, pea coat buttons. So that, that, whole, that whole period of history was well represented here. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the big things, the water source, uh, she said, although they didn't have any of those amenities, that she loved it here. She said she wouldn't tra trade her childhood to be anywhere else because there was so much to do. She has stories, and this is all on tape, and it'll be on the website at some point um, pretty soon, that, you know, about her brothers catching snakes, and they used to come down the hill on their sleds, and they would go right before that ledge that's now got uh, filled with water. They called that the frog pond. Just story after story. Um, one that jumped out, I, I, I know you guys want to get digging, so I'll, I'll wrap it up soon, but one that jumped out too was um, her, you could tell from talking with her that her mother kind of ran the show. Her, her father worked across the river, worked long hours, um, and it, I got the impression, at least from Abby, that her father was, was not the most ambitious. He was a little bit on the lazy side. So apparently they had an outhouse somewhere over here and we haven't been able to find the remains of it yet. Um, but the story was that there was the front side of the, the river side of the outhouse was, was falling apart. Actually, the whole thing was. Um, so she, the mother wanted the father to rebuild it and he was very apprehensive. So he came, he went to work and the mother actually ripped the riverside wall down. So when he came back from work and went in there, there was a clear view across the river. And at that time, the, the river bank on the other side was clear cut and it went up to one of the early Spear hospital buildings. So there were people all like outside and, and they could look right down and see him. So uh, shortly after that, I guess he, he got his act together and rebuilt the, the outhouse. So anyway, that's Abby Brown Frizzell's story. Now, uh, the second cellar hole we worked on is just over there. You can actually see it from here. It was a mirror image of this house, same design, a little bit smaller cellar hole, but the rest of it was, was pretty much identical. Um, we were a little bit disappointed over there last year because we found out, um, it didn't take long to figure out that there had been a fire over there that completely destroyed the house. And the majority of the artifacts we found were melted glass, um, nails that were fused together. Everything had been destroyed by fire with the exception of a few small things like um, shoe soles and some tools for, for that cobblers would use. So we, we named that the shoe last site because we did find one of those iron shoe forms over there and, and a lot of leather. Um, so we think there might have been a little cottage industry, a little cobbler shop going on in that, over in that building. But we're pretty much done with the excavation here. And the plan for the park is to create a little better access with trails. And uh, uh, this is what you're looking at here. We, we hypothesize anyway, is, uh, is a roasting platform. Uh, perhaps there was the, uh, they got the fire going and then laid the rock on top of that. Um, and then laid the, uh, the fish or whatnot on top of the rock. Um, that's just one hypothesis. Uh, we'll continue going down on that feature once we finish documenting it. Um, right now we're, we're using the total station to uh, shoot in each of the individual rocks in there. We have the elevation and uh, horizontal and vertical um, provenience of all those rocks. Like there's a lot more flood deposit, more recent, and that may have been what 
what's happened since contact with the alterations to the rivers. You know, the mills, the uh, oh, okay. dams, all that sort of thing. I think have uh, increased the amount of flooding that's that's happened here. But whether or not that's that's true or not, we see a lot of flood deposit on top. That's where you're seeing the the dark and light banding, uh -huh. almost. 30, 40 centimeters down before you get to some of the soils that we're finding more stuff in. And, you're, and within the floods, you're getting a lot of artifacts that are all mixed together. Both the European stuff and Native American stuff all mixed together. So they, they use uh, deer antler as the billet to knock the flakes off, but they also use stones like this. So you can see it's been repetitive hits on the rocks, some uh, breakage there, and of course the sand has completely broken down over time. Yeah, a lot of times they'll pick a stone that has a relatively hard, it's harder than the other stone, and it has to, from a Native American ceramic vessel, we often find them broken up, so this is a, a chunk of a Native American vessel. And so this is a relatively thick piece. Um, you can look at the decoration on the outside. This one's fairly plain. It just has a few little uh, indentations in it. This is probably the inside. Um, what we look at a lot is the temper that's inside. Um, you can use broken up crushed gravel, which is grit. You can use shell that's broken up, shell temper. Sometimes they would take the old ceramic vessels, smash those up and put that back in. That's a grog. Um, limestone, not so much around here, but um, I, or a mix of all those. And so uh, the, you're looking at all those different things when you're looking at, at a piece of ceramic like this. What was the temper used? How thick is the material? What's the, what's the decorative design or surface treatment? And those kind of change through time. And we know that because we have sites where you'll have a ceramic sherds next to a good charcoal sample, you'll be able to date those. And after enough sites like that, you say, okay, well that certain decoration appears during this time period. or we're finding this thickness of ceramic shirts during this time period based on the carbon-14 dates. And so after a while, you can start to put together, um, basically, it's, it's a way of cross-dating. So I don't need to have charcoal with this piece, just that most of the time when, when a piece of this design and this thickness has been found with datable material, it comes from this period, so then you can make that same assumption. The ancestors of the Abenaki, sure, were they? There's a lot of migration and whatnot going on. I don't, I don't know that, um, I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to say that these people were the descendants or the ancestors of this yeah. modern day group. It's, it's too far, too far back. The way that the natives prepared their food in those days, and you know, we're talking 3,000, 3,500 years ago, they heated the stones and they carried them in special tongs to where the food was. If the fish was laid out or if elk, yes, there were elk car caribou, they would have put these hot stones on the food that they were cooking. Rather than cooking it over, as we think today, barbecuing, where you'd have a fire going and you put the food on top of the fire. They did not do that, so they heated the stones and by carbon dating some of these stones, and some of them are cracked, which indicates that they were heated, it's going to give us some idea of what the time period is that we're talking about here. So the fish, a lot of the fish had to be dried, and that's what got them through the wintertime, dried salmon, mostly.